Hey Dress Teens Dress, I'm Abba Shrestha and welcome back to our Beyond the Brain series where we interview health professionals about mental health in order to get a deeper insight of different aspects of stress and mental well-being. Today I'm here with licensed marriage and family therapist Leslie Sanchez. Leslie, can you please start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here. Um, like the great introduction that I got, um, I am a licensed marriage and family therapist here in California. Um, I've known I wanted to be a therapist since I was 10. Um, right now, I run a solo private practice here in uh, San Diego, California. I mainly work with teens ages 16 and up and adults um, who have experienced some type of trauma or adverse experience. Um, so I work with a lot of trauma and I support my clients through the use of EMDR, which we're definitely going to talk about in this interview. And I'm also in the process of completing a training in IFS, internal family systems, which is another great model for training. Uh, I've been in the mental health field for a while, and I've been in private practice for three years. All right. So on your website, it says that you've had extensive training in EMDR, like you said before. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, so kind of the way I explain EMDR to my clients is it's like our brain has a filing cabinet where it files away everything that we've been through in the day and it kind of decides, okay, we need this information, we don't need this information, kind of like in the movie Inside Out. And when we go through trauma, it's like those experiences get stored in what I call like a messy way. They're hanging off the hanging folder. There's paper sticking out. It's easily accessible, right? So when something happens in our present moment that reminds us of the trauma or triggers us, it's like someone is ripping open that filing cabinet, grabbing that memory and like that memory like messy file with the memory and like slapping it down in front of our face and it literally feels like we're re-experiencing it all over again right and so with emdr right like our brain naturally does this filing system type thing our our brain naturally moves its eyes back and forth when we hit REM sleep and so with emdr we're basically accessing that system while you're awake right? So we actually use eye movement, or if we don't use eye movement, we have like hand pulsers or even tapping works. Um, and basically what we do is we go in and we grab this file and we look at it. And our goal is to desensitize it. That's the D, um, make it so make it less intense. And we want to reprocess it R, right? We want to, you know, right now, sometimes these memories are saved with what we call negative cognitions, negative beliefs about ourselves. For example, a negative belief could be, I am not good enough. And through reprocessing, we want to rip off that label and we want to put a more useful label, like I am good enough now. So things like that. So that's kind of the gist. We want to reduce the intensity of the traumatic memory and we want to view it from a different perspective. That's actually very interesting. I've never heard of that before. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. So that's really cool. Being a therapist yourself, have you undergone any kind of therapy and how has it influenced your practice? Yes. So I've definitely been in therapy, still, still am in therapy. I tell people all the time, I'm going to be in therapy forever because there's so much to learn about me um, and so much yet to uncover that I haven't uncovered yet. I started going to therapy when I started my master's program. Um, I actually went to therapy because a light bulb clicked in my head and it said, oh my God, I'm an adult now. I can go to therapy if I want to. I have insurance. It was like this, whoa, like I have the ability to do this on my own now without my parents. Like, and, and I was like 20, maybe like 21 at the time. Like, so ugh, yeah, like definitely not 18. Um, and, and it's helped me learn a lot about myself and even the things that I learn in therapy, I definitely pass on to my clients. Um, you know, the first time I went to therapy, my therapist, uh, explained to me that anger is a secondary emotion. It's kind of like the mask that we put onto what we're really feeling. And oh, ever since you said that, I share it with all of my clients. Um, so I think sometimes my, you know, the therapists I've had throughout my life have shared really good tools that I, you know, I put into practice for myself, but I also share with my clients as well. So that's, de it's definitely helped me and it, it's definitely influenced kind of maybe some of the approaches I take in my own therapy with my clients. What do you think is the number one issue that you've helped treat or improve among your clients? So I would say like 90% of my clients have experienced trauma, or if we don't want to use the word trauma, I like to say an adverse experience, something really big, something that changed the trajectory of your life. 
So I think that's the number one issue that I definitely treat. And I really love helping my clients view their trauma from a different perspective, right? A lot of the times when my clients have undergone trauma, they view it as, again, it's my fault. This happened to me because I wasn't good enough. You know, there's that negative cognition lingering because of that experience. So I really love providing my clients with psychoeducation and helping them understand like what trauma is, how it gets stored in the body. You know, you just see that light bulb go off and be like, oh my God, this is, this is related to that experience. Whoa. Um, so I really love helping my clients connect the dots and being able to show themselves compassion, right? You did the best that you could, right? Maybe a situation that happened in childhood, you were a kid, you had no control, right? How could you have known better? Like, you know, I really, you know, I think those are the really heartfelt moments that I get to experience with my clients and, you know, help them navigate through that. And then when we're talking about more on the mental health side, have you experienced or witnessed any kind of mental health problem before, like with someone with yourself or someone that's very close to you? And how did you react to that? Yeah, of course. So, you know, I mentioned that I've known I wanted to be a therapist since I was about 10. Um, And what happened when I was 10 was I have an uncle who struggles with substance use. Um, and there was one day where he came to my house and, you know, he was fighting my mom for $20 and, you know, he threw up, I remember he threw a plate and my mom was like, clean this up. And, you know, my mom told me to go upstairs. And I was literally thinking to myself, like, gosh, I, you know, I want to help people like you one day. I want to help, you know, I want to understand why you do these things. Like, if you see that you're hurting us, why do you keep doing these things? Um, and then of course, you know, when I became a teenager, I experienced my own struggles with depression and anxiety. And, you know, it was really lonely because, you know, I come from a very, you know, Hispanic household where emotions and therapy wasn't really talked about. So I had these really big feelings that were coming up for me and I would go to my family and they'd be like, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. You have such an amazing life. Why would you, why would you be feeling depressed if you have all these things? So it was kind of like, okay, I'm feeling this thing, but the people that, you know, I trust and care about are telling me everything's fine. So ah, is, is there something wrong with me? Right. And so I think because of my own lived experience, I really tried hard to, and you know, one of my goals is to really end the stigma related towards mental health and normalize seeking mental health or needing mental health services, right? You're not alone. And you know what, you know, your body is sending you these signals because that's, you know, it's a feeling it's, you're having a natural reaction to what's happening around you. And then talking about like mental health and stress, we all have our different kinds of coping mechanisms that we utilize in order to kind of de-stress or help our mental health problems. So as you kind of surpass your teenage years already, how do you think that your coping mechanisms when you're a teenager have kind of differed now that you're an adult? No, yeah, for sure. I feel like now as an adult, I actually have coping skills, right? I think as a teen, it was a lot of just me trying to convince myself that everything was fine. Like, look at your life. You have such a great life. You know, you shouldn't be feeling this way. Kind of just like gaslighting myself almost was my coping mechanism as a teen. But now as an adult, I definitely do a lot of like deep breathing. I like going on walks. I like playing with my dog. Um, with EMDR, we do a container exercise um, and my, you know, where we literally imagine ourselves putting, you know, difficult emotions or memories or experiences in a container. And my container is actually like a shoebox that I, you know, it's a shoebox that I imagine in, in my closet. It's not an actual shoebox that I have, but when I'm feeling overwhelmed, I sometimes just imagine, okay, let me just put this in there and put it in the closet. And then I designate a time and place to deal with it or pull it out right? Kind of give myself a little bit of space. Um, I think the biggest thing I've learned is, again, anger is a secondary emotion. So I try really hard to figure out, okay, what is it that I'm really feeling? And a lot of times when I'm feeling angry, you know, it's really, I'm feeling anxious and overwhelmed. Um, My, I have a cousin who struggled with postpartum depression, and she was telling me how the, the seven times tables really helped her you know, going seven times one is seven, seven times two is 14. And sometimes when I'm having trouble sleeping, I actually really do run through the seven times tables and it's really, really helpful. And that one's really just silly and fun. Um, you know, I, you know, I love that. And of course, you know, I really like journaling. Um, I have my little therapy buddy journal 
Um, but I think those are, you know, those are just the things that really work for me or even just kind of having sitting down and talking with my friends or my therapist. Um, I definitely like seeking support. Yeah. And then earlier you had mentioned that you had suffered yourself with like anxiety. So what mm -hmm. tips do you have for teens out there that's kind of struggling with anxiety? I would definitely say, listen to your body. Like if you are feeling something, it must be because something is happening. Right. And, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping and I'm seeing that we are transitioning into living in a world where mental and emotional health is more known and normalized and needed. So, you know, I want to let teens know, don't be afraid to, to ask for help. Right. And if you feel like your parents aren't being receptive, maybe seeking out in school, like does your school offer anything, any support groups or are there any therapists on site or even your counselor? You know, don't be afraid to seek out help. You don't have to go through this all by yourself because it can be very lonely. Right. And I and again, we're living in a world where social media is taking over and, you know, there's people who are sharing, you know, a lot of tips on, you know, coping skills. Right. Deep breathing, grounding. Right. You know, I even think journaling is really powerful. Just just get it out. Find a way to kind of release those emotions, whether it be through sports or talking to friends, writing about it, you know, just uh, really hard to kind of just sit with those feelings and just know you don't have to sit with them alone or shove them really deep down inside. There is an outlet, right? And I know it, it seems so dependent on our parents, um, but trying to be creative with, you know, different alternatives. You know, it seems like school is kind of the most attainable when you're a teen. And then talking about your career as a therapist, would you say that the main reason that you became a therapist was, like you said before, that experience you had when you were 10 years old? Or is there more into it, like a, another reason why you chose therapy as a Yeah, so definitely the event that happened when I was 10. And of course, my own lived experience. And I would also say, you know, my family's negative views on therapy also really inspired me because I said, yeah, I want to be a therapist to, to help change this idea that, you know, struggling with mental and emotional health is wrong. Seeking therapy is wrong. Like, you know, I want to be a therapist who, again, normalizes all of that. I think I think my family of origin really does have a, a big impact as to why I'm a therapist. Um, you know, I really want to be that influence in the like Latinx community that it is okay to seek therapy it's okay to struggle like it's okay to feel emotions right so I think all of those experiences really you know pushed me to want to be a therapist right um and I you know originally you know I wanted to be a, a psychologist you know I didn't even know about being a therapist until oh, I don't even know maybe when I was in college um, cause I realized, I realized the difference between, you know, like a psychologist, you'd have to get like your PhD and do more schooling and a therapist, you know, which is kind of what I wanted to do working with people. I don't want to do much the research stuff. So I think it, you know, it definitely helped guide my path. And then on the topic of therapy, what do you think are some misconceptions of therapists and therapy in general? I think a big misconception for therapists is that we're perfect. And that, you know, we have spectacular mental health, you know, when in reality, a majority of therapists became therapists because of their own mental health struggles, right? Um, and we have our good days and our bad days. And sometimes we're great at using our coping skills and other days we have such a hard time, right? So, you know, I, I really want to share that, like, you know, your therapist is not perfect. I'm not perfect. We all struggle and we totally can relate to everything that you are going through. So I think that's one really big misconception. And then the other misconception that seeking mental health services means that you're crazy or that there's something wrong with you. It's no, right? I I can't emphasize enough that our body is having a natural response to something that's happening, Right. You know, I feel like we live in a world that tells us just don't feel, right? Like I'll have clients who will come in and be like, I'm feeling anxious today, but I don't know why. And then we'll talk about their week. And I'm like, my gosh, like I, I totally can, it totally makes sense, right? You had a test or, you know, you were having issues with your family or your partner, like, oh, that makes sense. And they're like, oh, wow. Yeah. Right. Like it's really, you know, again, I really love helping clients understand, you know, you are literally having a natural reaction to what's happening right? 
you know, it's, it's sometimes we think like, oh, I'm feeling anxious and I don't know why, but when we really break it down, it's like, gosh, it makes sense. But I think a lot of the times we just, oh, we don't want to feel, but, it, and, but it's, you know, and I think a lot of the work in therapy is helping clients feel safe in their body and know that they can navigate and handle these, these feelings, right? Or even kind of this misconception that like, you know, therapies, you know, that therapy is just going to fix it all, right? Like, therapy is going to give you the the tools, right? And we're going to meet once a week. And like outside of therapy, you know, you also need to make sure that you are, you know, practicing and utilizing those tools. And I think I bring that up because um, I used to work with children. Um, I did my practicum and my associate hours with children. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be a child therapist. I'm going to work with children. Um, but one thing I had a really hard time with is, you know, a lot of parents, would say, you know, oh, it's, it's my kid. My kid is the one who needs to, you know, practice these skills and do these things. Um, and, and it was really hard to loop the parents in, but it's because the parents were also struggling with the idea of if there's something wrong with my kid, then it means I didn't do a good job. Right. So it was, it was a lot of work with the parents on helping them heal from that so that they can support their kids. Cause a lot of parents, that I was working with really thought like, no, my kid, my, you know, one time a week with you should be enough. And it's like, no, I, I need your support outside of session, helping the, the kiddo practice the skills and the tools. And I think right now in my practice, I no longer work with kids, but I really do love working with parents on that, on how their trauma or their upbringing influences the way that they parent. And even challenging that idea, if my kid's having issues, it means I'm not doing a good job. So I really love supporting parents with that. So my last question to you is what advice would you give to someone that's struggling with mental health or just like some kind of message that you would like to leave to our address teen stress audience? Yeah, you know, I think the big thing is don't be afraid to seek help, right? And I know, you know, and I've been there, I know how hard it is to find help, especially help that takes your insurance. And I think another role that I like to play in people's lives is helping connect them to mental health services. So if anybody has ever need in mental health services, please don't hesitate to reach out. I, you know, I am in contact with so many therapists and I'm part of different groups where I could definitely do my ultimate best to connect you with somebody in your area that accepts your insurance or offers sliding scale, just any need, because again, I just, I know how hard it is, right? I think there are so many barriers right now to seeking mental health. And I think we're all doing work to try to limit those barriers and make sure that mental health is more accessible. And, you know, we're getting rid of that stigma, right? That it is it is okay to not be okay, right? And just like how you go get a physical once a year to check on your physical health, it's also important to maybe meet with a therapist to check on your mental and emotional health, right? Like, life is hard and it's okay if you don't have the tools to navigate it by yourself. It's okay to seek support. All right. Thank you so much, Leslie, for talking to us about mental health and your experience with it throughout your professional career, as well as thank you so much for helping us address teen stress.